Tá. É, é melhor que a internet dela tá ao vivo, hein? Olha, a transmissão começou agora. É... Não, mas você está com o controle? Só um minuto. É, boa tarde a todos, sejam todos muito bem-vindos a mais um Biotox. É, pedimos desculpas pelo atraso aí, a gente teve um probleminha técnico. É, hoje é o professor Paulo que vai mediar a nossa palestra com esses convidados especiais, né? É, diretamente do exterior. É, o professor Paulo é, faz parte do nosso programa de pós-graduação né, em Biodiversidade e Conservação. E hoje é o primeiro Biotox do ano, então espero que todos, todos estejam bem. Sejam muito bem-vindos. É, qualquer dúvida, é só escrever no chat. E fiquem à vontade, sejam bem-vindos, doutor William e Dylan Clark. É, e que tenhamos aí uma ótima palestra. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to apologize for this delay. We had some technical problems, but I think now we are ready to start. Uh, so today is a really special day because we have the pleasure to have as guest lecturers uh, Professor William Raymond from the agronom agronomy department of, uh, from the University of Florida and also Dylan Clark who is an undergrad student in plant biology which is from, who is from the professor's uh, bio group. Today William and uh, Dylan will present to us a really new and exciting framework regarding necrodiversity and different ways to die. So once again, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And when you want to start, we are ready. All right, Paulo, can you hear us okay? Yeah, yeah. And you're, you're seeing the screen all right? Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for the, the wonderful uh, introduction. My name is Bill Hammond, and uh, next to me is Dylan Clark, uh, the person who does all the real hard work. Um, Dylan is an undergrad researcher in my lab, um, and I guess uh, I'm about to tell you about uh, a new framework uh, that we're working uh, towards called necrodiversity, and an important part of this is understanding how hot is too hot for plants to survive, um, and uh, for this last Almost 10 days, Dylan, uh, uh, myself, uh, Fernanda, and Paulo, and their labs here uh, in Rio Verde uh, have been working out in the Cerrado uh, and have really kind of already, even though it's very preliminary, discovered there's a lot of uh, diversity in how hot is too hot for plants in the Cerrado. Um, so uh, if you came here to listen to uh, uh, me talk, that was a bad choice. You should be here to listen to Dylan. And so after I introduce the framework, Dylan is going to give you a presentation. This is a, a kind of a split or shared seminar, and he will uh, uh, tell you about the work we've been doing and the method he's been working to develop on plant thermal limits. Um, so make sure you stick around for this. It's going to be the best part. We save the best for last. Um, I'd also like to say uh, to Fernanda, to Paulo, uh, and to everyone here uh, at uh, IFG in Rio Verde, uh, obrigado, um, really appreciate the warm welcome that Dylan and I have received here on your, at your institute, um, and we've made so many new uh, colleagues and new friends, and uh, we can't wait until some of you can come visit us in Florida, and we hope to be back pretty soon. And so with this, I'll get on to talking uh, uh, to you about plant necrodiversity. 
uh, or a, a variety of ways that plants can die. Um, the, this uh, term is maybe a little bit new to you because we just uh, have made it up recently. It comes from the ancient Greek necros, uh, which comes from earlier Proto-Indo-European necro, which means to perish uh, or to disappear. Um, and by diversity, we mean the variety. So put together, it is simply uh, the variety of ways that plants dysfunction, destructure, and die. And this is really uh, what my lab at the University of Florida has been focused on studying um, since I got there uh, uh, just a while ago. Um, you may be asking yourself, wait a second, don't we have frameworks for thinking about how plants die? Um, and we do. There are many existing frameworks um, for plant mortality. Uh, I would posit that most of these primarily are focused on uh, two roads to death. They have to deal with water limits and carbon limits, like this figure from a, a 2008 paper of Nate McDowell. Um, more recent versions of, of kind of this framework uh, is in a paper that we uh, uh, published along with Nate uh, in 2022, last year. Um, and they've gotten a lot more complex, but they still primarily focus on water and carbon, um, even if our more uh, complicated frameworks integrate uh, a lot of uh, pools and fluxes. Um, however, uh, there are more ways for plants to die than just running out of water or running out of carbon. Um, and in the Anthropocene, one of the pathways to mortality that I really think we need to give a lot more of our attention to uh, is uh, intense heat stress. Um, uh, plants, when they get too warm, can, uh, in, you know, it not only can accelerate other roads to mortality, like uh, uh, in increasing the rate of dehydration um, uh, of different plant tissues, but also um, there's just a temperature beyond which plant cells uh, will die. Uh, in the summer of 2021, uh, we saw this unfold in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, um, where there was uh, what was called a, a heat dome event. Um, and here uh, 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 we saw that really it was more heat than drought that led to um, widespread dieback of tree uh, 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 foliage, and in some cases, uh, uh, batches of forest. Um, and these heat extremes uh, were really kind of unprecedented. And yet our uh, best climate uh, uh, models tell us uh, that one of the most high confidence changes to expect in climate is not only uh, the warming that we are currently experiencing, but an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme events like heat waves. And when it gets really hot in the air, like this plot on the right is showing here, uh, the black line, uh, the surfaces of leaves can get even warmer. Um, they're dark, they absorb a lot of energy, and they have difficulty, especially um, if it's dry, but even if it's not, at keeping themselves cool. Um, this is the canopy here of a Douglas fir tree um, that uh, had needles approaching nearly 50 degrees uh, Celsius during that 2021 heat dome event. Um, and that is hot enough that even if the plants have access to water, um, they can, they can uh, uh, lose in part or in whole uh, their ability to survive. So when we think about plant necrodiversity, um, I really want to uh, start out by acknowledging that this is not some sort of an alternative <laughs> to biodiversity, you know, the study of the variety of ways that plants can live. Um, it's really just kind of complementary. It's kind of like the other side. And the way I envision it is that we've been shining our, our light of inquiry on all of the many ways that plants can live in agricultural systems, in uh, grasslands, and in forests. Uh, across many different biomes, we have uh, made tremendous advances uh, in the last century in understanding the variety of ways in which plants can live. Um, I hope that by the end of this presentation, you may be convinced that dying is not just living all the way down to zero. There are some unique characteristics of the dying process that warrant us having some additional study. Um, and so if, if you will, kind of the dark side of the moon here where the plants are uh, dead and dying, I think uh, is deserving of a little bit more attention. Um, and in this way, we can kind of have a more complete picture of what's going on in ecosystems. Um, uh, wh why should we be studying this now? Um, well, uh, vegetation mortality remains uh, one of the largest sources of uncertainty 
and global models of what's going to happen to carbon on the planet. Whether plants will be able to take up additional carbon um, or uh, die off and emit carbon, as shown in this figure by uh, Friedlingstein, I forgot to uh, uh, cite there, um, is uh, a problem we need to be able to address. A lot of this comes down to knowing under future climate conditions, will the plants live or will they die? And it's an important time to be studying it because around the world, from California uh, to Texas in the United States, uh, in Europe, as seen here with this spruce uh, dieback in Germany, uh, to uh, tropical dry forests like here in Pal uh, this, this shot in Palo Verde National Park in Costa Rica, um, uh, Southwest Australia, here's a photo of some canopy collapse in Jara Forest, uh, even places that you don't think of um, uh, uh, mortality and you think of as life, really, really biodiverse places also can have mortality events with uh, uh, hotter drought and climate drivers um, and really big old trees like these Atlas cedar um, in Algeria. And so uh, there's a lot at stake um, uh, in terms of uh, understanding plant mortality. Um, and I really believe that uh, uh, studying the variety of ways in which plants dysfunction, destructure, and die um, can be useful. We should also uh, just acknowledge that um, this is a really pervasive phenomenon. I just showed you a few select photos around the earth, but every point on this map is somewhere on earth where a forest mortality event like the ones I showed you in the photographs has happened in the last 50 years. Um, and so you can see across all of the forested continents, there are these observations that have been studied and published in the literature. And so this is really a pervasive thing across much geographic uh, space of the planet. It's also something that's impacting uh, pretty much all biomes that we find plants in. As shown in here, that same paper uh, from last year, uh, uh, whether you're in a tropical rainforest, this is an annual precipitation on the y-axis or uh, an annual temperature on the x, uh, so a really hot and wet place or a really hot and dry place or even a place that's generally pretty mild, eventually it can get hot enough or hot and dry enough um, for plants to die just about anywhere. Uh, another way to, to visualize this is shown with the, the, the circle size here being the number of uh, events that occurred in a particular climate space. Um, we have the temperature uh, on this side and the precipitation on this side. Uh, this was in the May issue of National Geographic. Um, and like I said earlier, because temperature and warming and even extreme warming events like heat waves are predicted to become more common, this is kind of the space where our Earth is going to be heading. Um, and we see that there's a, a, a quite a few events, even in places that are quite wet, um, where increased temperature seems to be a problem. Uh, to kind of just uh, sum that up, it's really that accelerated warming uh, and uh, drying associated with it is already revealing to us the microdiversity of ecosystems. Uh, no, none of these mortality events really look alike. They have a lot of range in terms of both the uh, 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 proportion uh, of the ecosystem that is affected, of the number of species which are affected, um, whether it's just one or many or mortality is even across the community. And so that these systems might be necrodiverse or have a diversity of uh, uh, pathways to death has kind of really become revealed as uh, compound extremes like hotter drought push more species past their limits of survival. And so you might by now be asking like, well, wait a second, uh, won't functional traits just solve all of this? I've spent a lot of my research career measuring uh, many functional uh, and especially hydraulic traits of plants. And these do describe the range of how plants function. That's why we call them functional traits. Um, and they're a really important part of this necrodiversity framework I'm sharing with you. But living processes are not necessarily um, uh, equivalent to dying processes. Um, because minimum function is not dying. Um, this is actually can be something uh, altogether different. To give you an idea of what I mean, uh, in that, that um, new framework we published last year in NREE with Nate, uh, uh, this is some data that's adapted from that paper where uh, five different mechanistic models that predict plant uh, 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 physiological response to climate extremes tried to uh, uh, explain the observed mortality uh, during one of these uh, tree die-off events. Um, and these models were developed to understand uh, using functional traits, the ways that plants live and even can dysfunction. 
Um, and for plants that survived this stress event, they did a pretty decent job. Each one of these lines is one of those individual models. Um, however, uh, the plants that were dying, uh, the models really did a much worse job at predicting um, what would happen with here a uh, water potential, kind of seen as one of the, the gold standard uh, uh, variables to understand the intensity of drought stress within a particular plant. And so um, here again, we see that these dying processes are hard to predict uh, if your, your framework for predicting them is built upon and based on living processes. So if functional traits um, help us uh, understand something about the function and structure of uh, uh, species uh, and the diversity of that uh, on the landscape in uh, populations or communities uh, or biomes, then how can dysfunction and destructure or the loss of structure help us do a better job of predicting um, what's going to happen with dying plants in the future? Um, I'll give you a visual example here about dysfunction and destructure. Uh, uh, from a drought experiment that I had done in uh, eastern red cedar. This is a juniperus virginiana. Um, and uh, we're going to look at some trees, individual trees. This is one that never experienced a bad day in its life, so it looks very happy. And as we move to the right, we're going to see increasing intensities of drought stress. Um, this one went to a water potential in its xylem, uh, a lot of tension, six megapascals. It caused about 20% of this plant's ability to move water to be compromised. Um, and although that happened internally inside the plant, this dysfunction, the structure of the plant didn't really change much. It retained its branches and its foliage, and it visually doesn't seem to have changed much structurally. However, if we uh, uh, crank up the intensity of drought stress, the, the destructure is going to increase. This plant lost about 66% of its ability to move water, and as a result, lost quite a lot of its canopy. Some of the green you see here wasn't present um, at the uh, intensity. This plant has kind of like undergone a bit of a structural transformation. So it not only has dysfunction, which has driven this initial destructure, right? Um, but now it's going to be different the next time a stress comes along. If we take it to the extreme, here's a plant that almost lost its complete ability to move water, 97% of its ability to transport water from the, the roots out to the leaves through stems was lost. Um, I thought this uh, particular individual in the experiment was dead for almost two months because the whole canopy was brown. Um, the green you see here is uh, several months after the drought uh, foliage that re-sprouted after the canopy had completely died. Um, and then, uh, you know, there are times that uh, a dysfunction and destructure drive themselves all the way to zero and we'll see a plant that's dead. But if we zoom in on this, this plant here that went uh, really, really far in terms of destructure, it lost all of its uh, existing canopy, um, we can start to understand a little something about how uh, this function driving destructure might be different in a subsequent uh, stress event. So uh, all of the existing canopy of this plant was lost and it was able to recover by re-sprouting. It has this kind of survival strategy, this, um, uh, you know, necrodiverse trait that will allow it to put out a canopy, um, even if it's lost all of its existing canopy to an extreme stress event. Another characteristic of this uh, species that's interesting is even though it lost 97% of its ability to move water, the areas stained in red here are where water can flow after the drought stress, um, it has the ability also to destructure its stems. Uh, we saw this individual after several months start to lose the bark on about half of its circumference of the stem. And so this destructure now means that this plant is kind of on a different road. Uh, the road that the, the plant that died um, at the end uh, here uh, took, which was complete failure, um, is not the road that this tree will go down the next time there's an extreme stress event. The conduits that remain functional in the plant are the three toughest percent of conduits left. Um, it has kind of been hardened by the experience. Its canopy has reduced in size, um, and even its uh, main stem has changed. And this can be the kind of thing that can put a plant on a different road altogether. And in fact, when we look at the plants which have outlived all of the other plants on earth, this is exactly what we see, is that destructure can actually end up driving future functions and dysfunctions. And a lot of our models ignore this right now. And so we don't have a good way for thinking about how 
uh, uh, plants may be able to adjust within an organism like this um, or between organisms and communities. Another example of some legacies of dysfunction uh, can be seen on uh, here. We're looking at the same plant that just uh, uh, we, we saw the event on the outside of, um, but uh, uh, it initially has a really high level of function. This is a cross section of its xylem and it's functional. Um, and at the beginning of the experiment, almost all of its xylem is working uh, and it has a very relaxed water potential. Um, by the uh, intensity of drought for this individual, it went to almost uh, like 84% loss of its ability to move water. Uh, uh, again, just near the cambium, some functional pipes, but most of its water storage and movement capacity has been lost. Um, and so these two things kind of peak here at time point two. Um, almost immediately following this, uh, just a few weeks later, the water potential, which is often what we measure to understand the function of a plant out in an ecosystem. We might measure the water potential in the morning to try and learn something about the soil, or we might measure it at midday to learn something about how stressed the plant is becoming. And if you had gone out uh, just a few weeks after this drought event and measured a plant in nature, you might have thought that you were looking at a plant that had all functional xylem when really there was a massive legacy of dysfunction that was not really visible to you. Um, and the only way for this to recover is the slow process of growth, right? Um, and so the plant has an opportunity afterwards to kind of re-establish uh, uh, function by growth and re-establish structure as well by growth. And so there's kind of this hysteresis where after there's a stress event and a catastrophic shift in the state of something like water transport, that it might take months or maybe even many years in a big old plant for function to get back to where it was prior to the stress. During all of this time when there's this uh, hysteresis between the initial state and kind of the transition state, um, this plant is going to be on a different road. It's not going to dysfunction, uh, destructure and die in the same way as a plant that does not have a legacy of dysfunction. So how can we study necrodiversity? Well, uh, one way to think about this is that there are, um, uh, along an axis of increasing stress from some minimum to maximum, um, we're kind of already doing it by studying functional traits. These can tell us about the limits of growth for, for a species, the limits of reproduction for a species, uh, which is essential for its long-term uh, uh, you know, uh, participation in the community. Um, it can tell us about the limits of recruitment um, for uh, uh, you know, younger individuals to come back after stress. Um, and these functional traits describing living processes are really the beginning of this necrodiversity framework. But what we must do is extend beyond this and recognize that understanding the limits of survival for organs and for leaves and fine roots may not be something we can accomplish with those functional traits alone. We'll have to study dying processes um, uh, like destructures and dysfunctions in order to get that information. Similarly, to know the limits of its survival for an individual, um, uh, which may be the culmination of enough coarse woody organs in a perennial or a root crown in an annual, um, uh, uh, we have to study these dying processes. Um, this also will be important for folks to be studying in terms of the uh, survival of propagules and limiting their availability to communities for reassembly after one of these mortality events um, that can, can really uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, threaten an entire system. Finally, this kind of uh, uh, will build up to limits of survival for populations of a species or for uh, entire communities. Um, and to understand how communities or ecosystems might disassemble or on the far side of this reassemble, we're gonna need to understand something about the dying processes and how many roads to death there are within a given community. I'll give an example of that in a minute. Um, uh, an example briefly about how uh, functional traits uh, uh, and dying processes can be used together to understand uh, necrodiversity is uh, we often use the functional traits of xylem vulnerability, like the water potential where 50 or 88% of the, the water transport of a plant becomes compromised um, to know something about what might be their risk of death. Yet this information alone has to date been really uh, uh, not sufficient for predicting um, uh, plant mortality uh, because the, the road to these thresholds can be really complicated and involve a lot of other traits that can be coordinated in uh, seemingly infinite 
uh, different uh, combinations. Also, it turns out that um, those traits don't always kill a plant. There are some plants which have uh, uh, dying processes and different, uh, uh, you know, dysfunction uh, uh, types of traits that can help them to escape uh, a near complete xylem vulnerability uh, or a near complete hydraulic failure event. Um, to give you an example of this, we can look inside this um, Mediterranean species, Pistacia lentiscus. You're looking at a young plant here on an x-ray microscope that's uh, looking through the stem. Uh, and uh, this allows us to see where in the plant without cutting it, there is water in these kind of uh, uh, brighter areas and where there is air. This is an embolism, a conduit that's failed. Um, and after a uh, really severe drought event for this little tree, um, it had a lot of destructure. The canopy, the entire canopy uh, that existed on it was dead, right? And uh, uh, according to the water potential taken at the maximum uh, drought stress, uh, there was about 94% of the ability to move water was compromised. This is a level of hydraulic stress that often would be thought of as very risky for a tree like this. Yet none of the individuals that went to this level died in this experiment. There were about 32 of them. Um, and after the plant got water, it started to restructure. Just like we saw in the juniper with some resprouting, this species seems to be able to nearly completely lose its hydraulic system, and yet it can recover. Um, after we dry down the stem from this plant, we can see that there's actually still a lot of water uh, in there that's available to help the plant persist, even if its existing hydraulic system has really been compromised by the drought. Um, and uh, this is kind of where functional traits, like these large vessels, um, which are for function and for the movement of water through a, a, a you know, expanded canopy like we see here on the left can be really beneficial, but actually by transpiring some uh, x-ray contrast solution, we found that it wasn't inside the vessels, but it was outside of them. It was in this kind of backup vascular system called basocentric tracheids. They're pretty common in Mediterranean plants or plants that are adapted to environments that have very long, nearly completely dry periods. And this allows the plant to kind of uh, reach a level of failure in its vascular system that most models would predict is risky or lethal, while at the same time providing kind of an alternate road to survival. Um, and so by having this kind of uh, uh, dysfunctional, vascular dysfunctional trait, um, this species is able to escape what most of our best current models would predict is death. Another thing to think about with necrodiversity is, well, how can we measure it? How can we quantify necrodiversity? Um, I, I've really been uh, uh, enamored lately with the idea in functional trait ecology of trying to uh, uh, understand the relationships between lineages and functional types. So instead of operating at the core scale of plant functional types, as we often have in the past, uh, we can look to the evolutionary histories of plants and their phylogenies to understand are there uh, uh, mortality functional types at different, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, divergences across a phylogeny. You know, the most, um, I guess, fine grain example would be that every species dies differently, um, whereas one of the more coarse ones might be that, no, it's just these, this big split between the Pinaceae and then the Cupraceae and Taxaceae. Um, when we look uh, at how these different plants die on the landscape or even in controlled experiments, um, we can see that the risk that a plant may die could evolve differently between different uh, 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 plants from different families. This is from a, a, a commentary published in 2019, just showing that the risk of mortality can accumulate really rapidly for some species like pines uh, and really slowly for some others like the juniper I was showing you before. Um, what are the traits that cause these different pathways or these different roads to death? Um, we still have a lot of work to do to understand that. We definitely have more uh, questions than answers so far. But if we look at some of the functional traits that in trees like these evergreen gymnosperms uh, seem to be associated with the risk of mortality, we can see that there's a pretty nice lineage uh, uh, relationship, whereas these Pinaceae up here are more vulnerable to a drought-induced failure of their vascular system, these Cooper's ACA below are quite a bit more resistant. Um, likewise, the slope or how fast the plants accumulate embolism um, can be a lot higher in these faster dying species than in these more slowly dying ones. And so um, this is just one example of how we might be able to 
to integrate a functional traits approach and a lot of the existing functional traits we've measured as we start to think about observing and quantifying and documenting necrodiversity. Um, another question is, well, how can we measure necrodiversity? And is this really just biodiversity in a trench coat? Um, and I think that's a good question to be asking yourself right about now, but I would suppose that it's not. And I'll give you an example here. So let's consider two communities. These are artificial hypothetical communities, but on the left, uh, we have community A, and on the right, we have community B. Um, they both have a Shannon index of about 1.39. If we assume that there's a relative, uh, an even abundance of these four species, um, and uh, uh, that might mean that these two communities are really similar. And if we were trying to use a, a, a diversity of species approach to predict what might happen during a stress event, we might expect them to respond really differently. Um, now, let's fill in uh, 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 some uh, uh, colors to these uh, different species shapes to indicate their road to mortality, right? So this red color, let's say this indicates uh, death due to a really low thermal limit. You know, a heat wave could, could really cause these plants, even without them running out of water, it could cause them to kind of tip over from life to death. And so now we already see the community on the right here is looking like it might not be um, doing the best under extreme heat. Whereas, for example, uh, uh, this kind of blue line, or I guess teal line can represent maybe an evergreen tree and the road that it takes uh, uh, to mortality um, during a, a drought event. Whereas perhaps this uh, golden road over here is a deciduous tree's uh, experience of drought. Um, it can vastly reduce its leaf area early on. And so maybe it dies in a different way than the tree that doesn't have that same luxury. Um, we could also uh, 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 maybe think about that juniper tree I showed you that has uh, some structural undershoot, a plant that has a history of dying back and maybe a smaller canopy, even if it occupies a lot of the same environmental space still. Um, and so these are kind of four different roads to death in the community on the left and just one road to death on the community on the right. So if we think about the Shannon Wiener Index, not of uh, 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 biodiversity, but of necrodiversity, it's the same thing in community A right here on the left. But on the right, the biodiversity kind of obscures the fact that this is a, a necrosparse community. It could really lack a lot of variation in the ways that plants die. And so um, in this case, if we don't have a framework for thinking about necrodiversity, we might really be um, uh, uh, not expecting uh, the kinds of uh, transitions uh, in, in uh, you know, a community or uh, the, the kind of more massive risk that a community might have that could be revealed from uh, using some necrodiversity framework to think about how systems might uh, dysfunction destructure and disassemble. Um, like I said, there's more questions than answers for studying necrodiversity. These are just a few uh, that I've been talking about this last week and a half with uh, Fernanda and Paulo uh, here in Rio Verde. I would love to, to um, talk to you at the end after Dylan has given his presentation uh, and hear what you think some interesting uh, questions uh, uh, for studying necrodiversity are. Um, this is a pretty new concept we're developing, and so I think it's going to take a lot of people uh, in the community contributing uh, and uh, critiquing uh, so that we can improve it and move it forward. Um, one of the things that is, is really exciting to me about the prospect of uh, 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 diverse ways to die is we've been here, uh, you know, for, I guess, um, almost, what, 10 days, 11 days, and uh, Dylan, uh, myself, and uh, the folks in Paulo and Fernanda's labs have all been pitching in, and we've measured uh, thermal limits on, uh, like, 37 species in the Cerrado, uh, several different phenologies of, of leaves within the same species for quite a few of them, and we see uh, a diverse pathway for plant mortality in the Cerrado on the basis of temperature alone. Um, and some of our future collaborations will include uh, uh, digging into more uh, hydraulic and functional traits. Um, and Dylan will be able to um, show you a bit more in depth some of this data and how it's collected during his talk. Um, but there certainly seems to be uh, uh, the, the potential for the Cerrado to be a, a, quite a necrodiverse community. 
Um, uh, so I just want to, again, kind of brag on Dylan. He's been working pretty hard to develop this method to measure thermal limits at a, a faster rate. Um, it's required a lot of testing uh, and a lot of diligence. And as an undergraduate student, um, Dylan has just really uh, uh, been exceptional at executing this. It's been a real pleasure to see him this week uh, teaching and uh, becoming the teacher instead of the student as she shares this method uh, uh, here uh, in the labs. Um, and so uh, without uh, further ado, I'll give you um, Dylan Clark. Hi, everybody. My name is Dylan Clark, and like Bill said, I'm a senior in my undergrad at the University of Florida. I've been with Bill's lab for a little over a year now, and for the past few months, I've been working on this thermal tolerance measurement system. Um, and I've really been focusing on advancing thermal tolerance measurement on a large scale, more of a high throughput uh, scale, uh, primarily for agriculture, but also ecological applications. So a little bit of history behind thermal limits. Um, this this, this has been measured for decades, um, but, but previously this was, this was measured through electrolyte leakage. You take a tissue sample from a plant, suspend it in water or some other solution, heat it to a temperature point, <clears throat> and at those temperature points, cell membranes would degrade. The, the, the components of those cells would leak into the suspension fluid, and the con conductivity of that fluid would, think, would increase as more cells broke apart. So you could track as temperature increased, more cells broke apart, and at a certain point, all the cells broke apart. But as time has gone on, we've moved to chlorophyll fluorescence as the main measure of thermal tolerance. Um, this is typically measured with 0.4 ohmers, which are imaged uh, up here, and you just hold it up to a leaf, press a button, and it takes a measurement. But recently, people have moved towards imaging chlorophyll fluorescence, and that's happening right here. This is the image of a heated branch of Douglas fir from the U.S. Um, that's been mildly heated. You can see that so there's some stress right here uh, in young leaves compared to no stress in these old leaves. And here, some pros and cons of electrolyte leakage versus chlorophyll fluorescence. Um, the main pros of electrolyte leakage are it can be performed on any plant tissue, and it is a direct measurement of cell breakdown in response to heat. But the major cons are it's very time intensive and it's difficult. And that's primarily the reason why we've why we switched to chlorophyll fluorescence, is it is much faster and simpler than that method. But the cons of chlorophyll fluorescence are it only measures damage to photosystems. And with that, you can mostly only measure on leaf tissue. In some examples, you can see um, photosynthesis in stems, but it's very rare. So utilizing fluorescence imaging, um, you can use it in several ways. One, um, you can take images of several samples at once. So this image right here shows one image of three coffee leaves that have been heated to 45 degrees Celsius. Um, you can use images to track complex damage. So this is one of the native species from the Serrata that we heated. And most of the tissue around the veins um, is still alive, uh, shown by the blue color. This is around 0.5 chlorophyll fluorescence, which is damaged but not dead. But all the other tissue around it sits at around 0.2, which is much closer to complete death. And then on top of that, um, having these full images provides a lot more data than just a single point and shoot uh, data, data point. So kind of building off the ability to take images of several samples at once, I designed this grid to hold 30 samples of uh, leaf tissue. Um, and the goal of this is you can put uh, 10 treatments in this grid with three reps at each treatment, and you can image enough data to build one thermal tolerance curve off of one image. And overall, this has kind of decreased the time to, uh, to collect this data by about 90%. So I'll tell you a little bit about the process. You take mature, healthy leaves off of whatever species you're interested in. You cut 30 leaf discs from each, spe from each species, and then you group those 30 leaf discs into 10 treatments with three reps per treatment, and each of those treatments is a temperature ranging from 25 degrees all the way up to something like 65 or 70 degrees. You then place each treatment group in its respective water baths, and you heat the leaves up for 20 minutes, fully submerged in that water. 
And then after those 20 minutes, you pull the leaves out and you let them rest in, in a dark place for 12 hours. So once those leaves are rested, you then place them into that 3D printed grid and you place them in a uh, gradient of increasing temperature from left to right. So it starts at 30 degrees Celsius on the left and each, each uh, set of three is a step up by five degrees Celsius. And then that ends up leading to 30 to 45 on top. Then you start again at the bottom on the left and start at 47.5 and go to 65. And then you place this grid in the in the chlorophyll fluorescence imager, and this shows that image. Up here is the RGB image. Down here is the chlorophyll fluorescence image. And from 30 to 45 C, all of this tissue is very healthy, sitting around 0.75 to 0.8 chlorophyll fluorescence. But starting at 47.5 degrees Celsius to 65, you start seeing that decline and um, transition into complete death. So we've written a code to extract the data and create these curves all in one simple process. So this is also been an area where we've been able to improve the time commitment to this, to this variable. So this is just a screenshot of our code pulling data for one of these curves. So very similar to this last image right here. You see healthy tissue and then as temperature increases, that tissue starts to take damage, going from 0.8 to 0.6, then continuously get, uh, increasing the damage, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.07, and eventually zero. And this is the curve that is created off of that uh, data, data extraction. So right here we have 30 degrees Celsius. That is, those are these three temperature points. And right here we have uh, 60 degrees Celsius. Right here are these three temperature points, and that's. This just shows the gradient as of temperature increase and vitality decrease as that temperature increases. So some benefits and drawbacks to the system that we've realized as we've tested it in the Serato. Um, benefits, that 90% time reduction saves a whole lot of time. We've been able to sample 37 Serato species and make overall 46 curves, including uh, differences in phenology like Bill was saying. Um, and we've optimized this code to run all of that data at once. With some drawbacks we found, uh, especially in the Serato, around 10% of the Serato species have some sort of wounding response when you take leaf discs out of the whole leaf. And that has created graphs like this, where even at a temperature like 30 degrees Celsius, you're still seeing immense damage that should happen in a healthy leaf. And here, all of the uh, chlorophyll, chlorophyll Chlorophyll fluorescence is declined in comparison to graphs like these. Um, in my testing in Florida, I never saw this problem. So it's definitely something that was new to experience here in Serato, but we've been able to work around it a little bit and have some methods to try and clean up this data. So we still think that some of this data will be useful in the end. So this is, again, like Bill said, our very preliminary data uh, that we've pulled from these 37 species. Uh, this is excluding some palm species, but like around here, you can see that there is some grouping of thermal limits um, between close relatives. Um, but in other selections, there really it loses that grouping, and there's a high amount of variability between relatives, especially in this group right here. So it really just varies between what species you're looking at. It's been very interesting to uh, see come to fruition. And this is kind of that graph Bill showed you earlier. Um, here we have these yellow points or T-crit. That is where cells begin to die. And the red dots are where are, is T50, where 50% of cells die. And these are those 37 species of serrato plants. So there is a range in T50 of about, I'd say 10 to 12 degrees Celsius, which is pretty major. Um, our T-crits, we're still trying to get those confidence intervals a little more in check because this is we really just finished up our data collection today so we're still cleaning up all our data <laughs> the samples um, are still hot yeah it's like we're we're just coming off the data collection so we still have a lot of cleaning to do um so this is just one example of ecological applications of the system and then right here is a study i did back in florida 
on breeding lines of a turf grass called moisture grass. And we found a range of about five degrees Celsius difference in T50 within a single species. And for breeding purposes or agricultural purposes, this can be very important because previously, no, none of us had really expected this much variation within one species. So that's something that could be explored further. And then uh, another thing that could be explored further building off of this study I did back in Florida was ties between thermal tolerance and drought tolerance. So we found in this study that our most thermal tolerant plants right here were our most drought uh, susceptible. So right here, this was the percent canopy death of these plants under a extreme drought. But our least thermal tolerant plants over here saw less than 25% canopy death in a, under that same drought. So there's a trade-off, at least in bush grass, between these two uh, variables. And one thing we're really excited to learn more about is uh, Fernanda and Paulo's lab are gonna take hydraulic data on all of these plants that we just did thermal limits on. So we can hopefully build some sort of graph <coughs> similar to this that will compare those two concepts. And yeah. Yeah, and so uh, thank you, Dylan. Uh, I gotta say, um, we never could have uh, measured 37 species without your just uh, uh, machine-like work here in the Cerrado. Um, and it's just been a pleasure to see you uh, take this system that you've worked so hard to develop and apply it here um, in this wonderful uh, 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 and diverse uh, biome. Uh, and so with this, I think uh, we would be happy to take any questions. For this really nice presentation, uh, I must admit that the first time that I heard the term necrodiversity, it blew my mind because it was so radical, but yet makes so much sense, especially when we put in context all the gaps in the field. And also, uh, thanks Dylan for the uh, great presentation. Dylan also blew our mind here in the lab because this new protocol to establish to characterize thermal limits is working so well. Like we processed 37 species in like four days, five days of work. So it's amazing. So thank you so much guys for the opportunity to, to hear about these topics. Uh, guys, now you can send questions through the, through the chat. I'm going to read some that we already received. Uh, we received some from here. Uh, and others from WhatsApp. Let's start from a uh, question from Maria. For non-photosynthetic organs, do you think it would be possible to use this methodology and replace fluorescence for electrolyte leakage? I think this is for Dylan. Yeah, um, I mentioned to some extent you could try and make electrolyte leakage more high throughput, maybe with something like a 96 well or something along those lines with tissue in each of those wells. Um, I just don't know how fast it would be to take, you know, um, what was the tool called? To uh, like the conductivity probe. Kind of conductivity probe. I'm not sure how long it would take to actually go through and measure each of those points, because I'm pretty sure they don't have any set of those that can measure, take multiple measurements at once. So by, in the end, you'd still be doing one measurement at a time on all of those, uh, all of those plots. Although I will say we did, I guess make we made three curves on stems. Yeah. So while we were here, um, some of the species from the Cerrado, um, they had green fluorescent stems, and we took those stems and put them in the same grid. Um, we haven't extracted the data off of it yet because we have to modify the script a little bit, but it came up well on the imager, so that we're excited to look at that data. Yeah, so the, the limits of other organs, even with a, a modified version of this method, might be a bit more tractable. I think we also just made one curve on the pedicel of flowers um, that seemed like it probably was going to work. Yeah. So that's exciting. Yeah, so um, there are <laughs> there's chloroplasts in lots of places, um, and so this is good news. But yes, for some uh, really important tissues that it'll be important to know thermal limits of, probably a more classic approach will be required for now. 
Thank you for that great question, Maria. Yeah. Uh, Paul, you're muted. Sorry. Now we have a question that was sent by WhatsApp to Fernanda. I will read first in, uh, in English, then in Portuguese. Uh, climate change can, uh, can change biodiversity. Do you think climate change could also change necrodiversity? For example, the numbers of ways to die may increase as species atomize to climate change. Now, in Portuguese, in Portuguese, as mudanças climáticas podem afetar a biodiversidade. Vocês acham que as mudanças climáticas também podem afetar a necrodiversidade? Por exemplo, de que forma uh, as formas de morrer podem afetar uh, a forma que as plantas se aclimatam num cenário de mudanças climáticas? Ok, guys? Yeah, thank you so much for the question that was sent to Fernanda. Um, I, this is uh, one of those open questions that I think at the moment we can't answer with data. So I'm going to give you uh, uh, an answer of what I think or what I guess, um, which is that I do believe that, that the ongoing and further climate change, especially extreme events, are likely to uh, continue to reveal to us what is the existing necrodiversity of a system. Um, and if you think about the example that I gave, uh, I showed the one system which maybe would be really susceptible to a heat wave event and all four species could, uh, could die, for example. Um, but if we think about the other one, it had maybe a, a four different uh, you know, necrotypes or uh, a path to mortality. Uh, but if it loses one of those members, now maybe it has three. So if uh, uh, the traits that give rise to um, uh, the, the destructure and dysfunctional traits that give rise to the particular uh, mo mode of mortality um, are fixed, then in this uh, uh, example, maybe climate change could also reduce necrodiversity, um, like it is a, a threat to biodiversity. On the other hand, um, it's very possible that some of these uh, traits, like the thermal limits Dylan was sharing, are uh, 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 plastic and may be able to acclimate such that species which undergo successive stress events may start to put together uh, additional combinations or additional uh, uh, you know, ways to persist in the face of even further stress. Uh, and so on the other hand, it is entirely possible that um, necro diversity could increase. You could get maybe more richness in the ways to die um, with some stress. Uh, I think one uh, uh, conversation I had uh, with Fernanda and Paulo earlier uh, this week was about two biomes here in Brazil, the Amazon and the Caatinga. Uh, and uh, while both have a really high biodiversity, maybe the plants in the Caatinga, which I, I got to meet some in a greenhouse, we weren't able to travel there, um, but uh, these are really tough plants. You know, they have big tubers underground. And so they've kind of maybe already given us a view at what might happen if climate change causes some drying or some warming or both at the same time in a biome like the Amazon. And in this case, it might be that the plants become a, more, a little bit more homogenous in their uh, particular strategy to avoid mortality um, uh, than uh, uh, um, in a biome which has not yet had all of that intense pressure. Um, and so I think one of the ways that we could actually begin to answer this really nice question with some data is to start to compare and go out and try to quantify um, uh, uh, the necrodiversity in these systems and then compare it uh, between them uh, in contrasting climates so that we can get a bit of a glimpse on how extreme climate condition and its frequency might impact uh, necrodiversity uh, in the future. Yeah. I'll mute it again, Paulo. Forgot the microphone again. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, before this one, I will read one that uh, sent, uh, Anna sent. So she would like uh, to know what motivates you guys to this and how it's been the experience for you guys so far. Oh. I'm sorry, we lost the question. Can you re repeat really quickly for me, Paulo? 
Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, Ana is asking, uh, what motivated you guys to come to Cerrado, to study the Cerrado? And what are you thinking so far about the, the experience? Ah, okay. Um, I think I will answer this one. Uh, uh, the motivation initially to come uh, uh, here to Rio Verde um, was not uh, uh, in particular the Cerrado. It was mostly that I had uh, worked very briefly in uh, my own graduate studies when I was in my PhD. I had the opportunity to work with Fernanda there. Um, and uh, upon meeting them, uh, I knew that we both had, uh, uh, all three of us had some questions about how plants die uh, and wanted to work together to answer these questions. Um, and so I kind of remember telling them five years ago that someday, someday, if I get a lab, I'm going to find a way to come and visit you um, and to see how the plants are dying and, and to work together on these questions. Um, and so a lot of times where you study is a function of both where you are and also who you have the uh, privilege to work with. Um, it's been our great privilege to work with Paulo and Fernanda. Um, the Cerrado, uh, now of the many different things we could do here, uh, uh, it was very clear from early on that the Cerrado would be a really interesting place because it is dry there for six months. There is such a diversity of forms of plants and functions and dysfunctions of plants. Um, and this is also something uh, uh, that was really, I think, intriguing for us, thinking about a place where thermal limits might vary a lot. Um, how have we found it? Uh, it's been great. <laughs> it's been great. Dylan's right. Um, it's really been a wonderful thing to be able to come and uh, meet new plants and also new people. Um, and yeah, we've really enjoyed working in the Cerrado, I think. Yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, now another question. I am picking some of, some of them. Uh, we have another that I think is for Dylan. Uh, since the planet is becoming warmer and drier, do you think the Cerrado species might be more endangered? Então, pessoal, traduzindo, já que o clima está ficando mais quente, mais seco, vocês acham que as plantas do Cerrado correrão mais riscos lá para frente? Yeah, so if, if we look out across the plants that currently make up community at least in the particular cerrado we were in i should i should clarify that while the cerrado is a vast biome we collected uh, uh, uh samples from species within just a few hundred meters of one another um and so when i look at if we think of just the necrodiversity in terms of the thermal limits that exist in the cerrado um there is a variety of thermal limits and because a climate extreme like a heat wave might occur, um, uh, uh, you know, only to a certain maximum intensity, there might be some more vulnerable members of the Cerrado, like we've seen on the lower end. But because there's a range of about 10 to 12 degrees Celsius, um, there are a lot of plants which might survive a, a, an event that gets leaf temperature, say, to 52 C, which if the air is at 40 or 45 during a heat wave may routinely occur. Um, uh, especially if it's a top of drought and the plants lack their fundamental mechanism for cooling uh, or, or lowering their own temperatures. Um, so I don't know about uh, uh, becoming more endangered because I am still so new to working in the Cerrado that I'm not sure the status of each of these species yet. But this is something I think that along with Paulo and Fernanda and the expertise of their labs, um, including our local extraordinary uh, plant identifier, Lucas. Um, I think we will all kind of be thinking and working together on this question um, because it's certainly on our minds as we think about the Cerrado. And it's a biome that is um, endangered, not just due to climate, but due to many disturbances and fragmentation. Um, and so by understanding the way in which these different plants in the Cerrado may die, um, we could maybe hope to answer your question a little better in the future. But like 
Like Dylan said, our samples are still warm. We took the last samples out of the water bath just a few hours ago. Um, we kind of just very preliminarily put some plots together for you today because we're so excited about just the diversity of, of, of observations here in the Cerrado. But um, we still have a lot of deep thinking and analysis and, and conversations to have. Um, and the good news is uh, there are so many great new colleagues that we have met while we are here uh, at IFG and Rio Verde. Uh, and we're really looking forward to, to trying to continue working together to answer really important questions like this. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Now we have a question for a dear friend, Noel Martins, Samuka. He asks, uh, we know that uh, reproductive structures can be quite sensitive to thermal stress. Have you tried to access thermal tolerance in flowers, for example? Então, o Samuel está perguntando, seguinte, a gente sabe que as flores, os órgãos reprodutivos, eles são muito sensíveis ao estresse térmico. Então, está perguntando se de alguma forma a gente já tentou é, estudar a tolerância térmica em flores. So we tried for the first time on this trip, um, we took flowers from two species and petals, the petals didn't show up for chlorophyll fluorescence, but the uh, um, pedicel um, did show up for fluorescence. Um, so we are going to try and build some sort of flower um, thermal tolerance curve based off the uh, pedicel. And um, that the two we did matched the uh, leaf thermal tolerance for the plants we've done from, from the Cerrado. So it seems like, at least from, from a pedicel standpoint, it's very similar to leaves. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, yeah, so the, the structure, the, the organ, the part of the flower that we were able to image was not probably the most thermally vulnerable, not the, uh, you know, uh, 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 stigmas or uh, the ovary or the petals. Um, and so because of this, it could be the case that there are some more vulnerable parts of the flower. You know, if the, if the petals are unable to uh, uh, maintain their um, hydraulic skeleton, as Paulo's group has been working on lately, um, this, this could be a really big problem. And so there's a lot to learn about that. I suspect that um, to make thermal limits in these organs using uh, the electroconductivity method may be more beneficial. There were uh, some of the petals of flowers that we pulled out of the temperature bass, even though the pedicel still looked pretty good, the petals were almost completely gone. It was like they had just they had melted, like <laughs> d dissolved, right? And we were like, wow. And I don't know how often people just stick, you know, flowers under hot water, but um, that's what we've been up to. Uh, and yeah, it's a really good question. I don't know that the high throughput method would be super effective. We will have some preliminary data once we modify for these different um, organs. Uh, as is often the case, we came in with the plan for leaves. And then uh, Dylan and, and Paolo and Fernanda and I were all like, well, what about stems? What about flowers? And so we just kind of had a, a thermal limit bonanza this last, uh, 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 you know, uh, 10 days. And yeah, we're excited to see what worked and, and learn from what didn't. Uh, I guess that uh, uh, Dylan talked about uh, a little bit about this. Uh, do you think that somehow thermal limits could interact with drought tolerance? For instance, do you think there there is a trade-off between thermal and drought tolerance? Então, o pessoal está perguntando aqui se de alguma forma a gente pode esperar algum tipo de trade-off entre tolerância ao estresse térmico e pela seca. Se, por exemplo, plantas mais tolerantes a altas temperaturas vão ser também mais tolerantes à seca. Yeah, so for sure in soy grass, that's the one species I've done a heat and drought study and then a heat by drought study and just see how they interacted. Um, in other studies that have come that have been published uh, in coffee, for example, there's a positive correlation between heat thermal tolerance and drought tolerance. So the, mo the most thermal tolerant plants were the best drought performers, which is the opposite of soy grass. So it seems like it's a species by species uh, variation, if there is any, and it's it, it just needs to be explored further. And we're kind of that's what we're hoping to find from all these Cerrado species. 
Yeah, I, I think this is um, a, a really interesting question. And Dylan, I think you hit the nail on the head. We just don't know yet enough. Uh, we've not measured uh, both uh, sets of traits uh, and both strategies in enough species to draw some sort of a more general conclusion. Um, it's not a drought resistance trait, but we did get to peak uh, just a few hours ago at some of the um, traits like leaf thickness. Um, and we're noticing that the thinnest leaves typically uh, had the uh, uh, highest um, thermal limits, if I'm remembering right, and the, th the thickest leaves, which you see a lot of thick leaves in the Cerrado, had lower um, thermal limits. Um, and so we're really thinking that the, the you know, amount of water in the leaf is uh, interacting with uh, potentially these observed thermal limits because it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. Um, and as we work uh, along with uh, Fernanda and Paulo and their labs to uh, uh, get uh, uh, some more understanding of the drought strategies and the drought traits of these same Cerrado species, uh, hopefully this will come uh, become more clear to us. Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for joining the BioTalks today. It was a big pleasure to have you guys. And uh, especially for us to learn a lot in these days about uh, plant mortality, necrodiversity, and thermal limits. So once again, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who joined us today. See you soon. Bye. Thank you.